a lot of research. Um, and I think in each session we have also discussed how these findings link to policy and practice. Uh, and I would like to hear from the chairs in each session uh, yeah, what you concluded and what it means for, for policy and practice, what we discussed today. In our group, under the umbrella Youth Voices, we had like three wonderful presentations. One from Anna Page, one from uh, Belen with a very hard to pronounce uh, last name, and uh, Yanni Gabriel. Um, it was uh, Anna's presentation was really about uh, youth participation and um, how youth groups um, group participation impact social inclusion of young people, and she did research in Kenya. Uh, Yanamik's uh, research was about gender and meaningful youth participation and sexuality education, and she did a study in uh, Kenya and Uganda. Um, both these studies were um, uh, hosted or with support from practitioners. One was Matthew, where I work for uh, Anna's uh, research, and uh, Yanamik's one uh, with Dance for Life. Um, they both generated recommendations that um, are, I think, uh, picked up by, uh, by the organizations. They then did a research around um, international child marriage discourse. She did that from uh, here, from the Netherlands. Uh, she uh, studied at ISS, one of the other two at uh, UFA. And um, she had uh, uh, more or less uh, hopes that the findings that she uh, is, uh, has discovered and is still discovering because she's still writing the thesis will be uh, picked up. So maybe I think it's interesting to just mention the recommendations briefly or one recommendation from each and then, um, yeah. So one of the key recommendations I think from Anna was that um, community stakeholder training and dialogue on local interpretations of meaningful youth participation is needed. So um, what is meaningful, especially meaningful youth participation, is something that still uh, needs to be discussed in communities to understand better the local context. And that is something that um, Simavi has picked up, for example, in the discussions and planning with this organization in, uh, in, uh, for the future. Um, Balen, uh, she um, hopes that unpacking this uh, child marriage discourse <coughs> stimulates practitioners to better engage with um, um, uh, with specific context of, of child marriage. And I think uh, what I understood is that she hopes that an, an um, increased understanding um, for the limited consequences of this, uh, uh, this course will happen. Uh, I thought it's a very interesting um, discussion, but um, yeah, it needs it needs uh, still more discussion, I guess, and maybe we can also see how we can help Baden in what she can do to bring uh, her findings to the uh, to the practitioners and policymakers. And Yarmika, she had um, quite a few very practical recommendations, I think, which she has already discussed with Dance for Life. For example, and how it's important to split boys and girls when you discuss uh, uh, sensitive topics, but also in the importance of training um, teachers and peer educators more about gender issues, and um, also to put more attention to the social environment where young people uh, live in. So those were key recommendations, I'm talking too long, I guess, that I think uh, show uh, uh, how uh, the research links with practice and policy. And maybe my key question to the group for discussion is, um, how else do you see these uh, studies uh, relevant? And how can, particularly studies that unpack dominant discourses, such as child marriage or like things we think about being for youth participation, can best reach practitioners and policy makers to be able to do something with it. We had two very interesting uh, um, presentations. Um, and it's great that we only had two because it meant we had lots of time for discussion. 
Um, there were uh, 19 people in the room from 10 countries, and uh, we had uh, activists, researchers, researcher activists, policy activists, practitioner activists, etc. And I think we all ended up thinking that, you know, action was the important thing. Um, the two presentations were effectively um, around uh, uh, um, how family members of people who could inject drugs need to be helped to support and promote a positive image around harm reduction. Um, a, a study in Ukraine from, uh, from Sandra, and uh, also uh, from uh, South a, a study in South Africa from Dewey, um, how um, uh, we were talking about authors of vulnerable children who were not being told their HIV status um, uh, through a supposed protection, um, effectively how that could in fact increase vulnerability. Um, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, and I think that there are two, there's some themes that came out. The themes that came out were, number one, and I think they took my takeaways, really. Um, at what point in relation to children does self-knowledge about HIV status become necessary? So in other words, what were the disclosure deadlines? And at what point? So they might change. And it might be very interesting to look at when they needed to, 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 to know things about their HIV in relation to sexual practice, when they might need to know about adherence. And that will change over the course of time, but it might be something to really look at. Um, uh, uh, and I suppose um, it's supporting the supporters was the other thing that came out. Um, whether it's those who are the caregivers of children who are actually frightened about, or don't have the information about about being able to deal with disclosing to the child and actually dealing with the issues of the child. Um, uh, uh, and so how could they some people be supported in, to helping the agency of the child involved? And also in terms of IV drug users and families of IV drug users being supported within the family context um, because people didn't know enough about harm reduction, harm minimization. And um, so there are ethical considerations all the way through. Um, and that came up time and time again. Um, and I suppose the other thing is, is that we, we looked at um, uh, you know, what, what the definition of harm reduction is, and effectively what causes the, for, um, for both types of, wherever you look, um, in relation to HAD, what causes the propensity for vulnerability? Right? That it is, from very clearly from these, uh, uh, um, from these studies, it's nothing to do with the pathology of the individual. It's about the environment in which they live. And I think that needs to be hammered down time and time again. And I suppose the other uh, um, um, uh, 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 implications for, um, uh, for, um, for policy is how do you, number one, how do you deal with all those ethical considerations. But I think an interesting thing, both the researchers, one more than the other, actually came out, it's wonderful designing the thing when you're sitting there in Amsterdam. And then you go out into the field, mm -hmm. and you had to totally change it. And I think it was really wonderful to see that the challenge of changing it and, and working with, with you know, a slightly different study to what they started with was something that is, uh, that fle number one, that flexibility needs to be built in. Number two, in terms of practice, it also need, or, or, or almost needs to be um, uh, uh, allowed for. Um, and it needs to be recognised because, as, uh, as uh, somebody once said, uh, well, if we didn't work with the unintended consequences of our research or the unintended outcomes of our research, we wouldn't have discovered penicillin, for example. And I think we need to look at the same element uh, when, when we're looking at the social sciences. And between the theory and the practice falls the shadow, we need to work with that shadow um, because that's the reality of the ground. And I think it's very useful both the... Uh, presentations have, have done that to a certain extent. So that was it. Anybody else going anything to add quickly? Did I miss anything out? Did I misrepresent anybody? No, I won't be seeing anybody talk, then that's fabulous. <laughs>
uh, she brought out really the tension between the attention the, there is for family planning issues, but hardly any attention and resource attention for infertility issues, uh, causing infertility treatment to be mainly uh, available within the private sector, uh, meaning that that uh, has consequences for uh, people with less means to access those services. Uh, what also came out very clear from the presentation that it's not only about access to treatment itself, but also access to information. And I think that came through all the three presentations actually uh, in our session, that uh, there's still a big gap between um, people with education and people with less education, uh, the access to the information they have. The second presentation was from Vernon. Uh, he talked about uh, family planning and he looked uh, at uh, use uh, and not so much the factors that play the role from the supply side, but mainly into the factors that play a role from the demand side. Having said that, there was an interesting uh, remark from one of the people uh, in our group who said, uh, because there was a lot of attention for cultural <coughs> and social issues, norms, values from the demand side, and she underlined it's also important to look at those cultural and social aspects on the supply side. And I think that's something that I would really like to underline. I think we tend to forget the, the culture that's there in the services which has uh, an influence on services offered and particularly how services are offered to whom, etc., which also has consequences for access for certain groups. Um, the third uh, case that was presented was a case um, presented by Richard. Um, he did research in Rwanda. He compared uh, two hospitals and he looked into near-miss cases. Um, and particularly the underlying reasons contributing to near these cases. He had a control group so he could compare. Uh, what came out of his study that there's quite a big variety in, in reasons, medical reasons, uh, cultural reasons, economic reasons, um, education, no, uh, um, name it all. Yeah, there it was also what I said before, it was a there you could clearly see that women with less education particularly uh, were much more at risk of being to the near this case. Um, as well as uh, in Rwanda, which surprised me a bit because in most countries mm -hmm. internal health care is free of charge. Uh, in Rwanda that was not the case or you could uh, apply for being exempted, but people again of the lower strata did not know that they could apply for such exemption scheme. Um, other issues that came up in discussion uh, afterwards is, um, I think, data. There is still a, a lot of data missing when it comes to relevant issues, for example, on infertility. There's not even data available of how big that problem is, what the needs are for uh, people. Uh, male involvement came up as an issue, um, task shifting sharing, what are the implications for that when it comes to better access, and uh, what came also out in the last presentation was that the motivation of the staff is relatively low. Um, I think that is something that comes up, up often. Uh, how can we improve on that ourselves working on that? 